sword, so I'm going to tread on the knee of this and not the Anyway, um, uh, uh, as I say, welcome to the Newton Society Conference. We have seven speakers today. Uh, I know that, uh, I hope to thank that for his uh, efforts in gathering together the speakers. Uh, we were worried that we wouldn't have enough speakers to, to, to fill a one-day conference. Did we then? Uh, three of us on the committee who were proposing papers had to uh, withdraw them in order to make space for uh, uh, members who were not on the committee. So uh, uh, it, it, it's been very well supported, and I thank you all for coming. Um, <coughs> I don't have to do my air hostess bit because Dan has already done that, I think, because he's where the emergency exits are. So that's, uh, that's all taken care of. Uh, and I've also been asked uh, to. Um, give a brief overview, and by brief we mean 10 minutes, uh, of the background of the economy during this period, so that we have some sort of background uh, with, with which to compare uh, the uh, various developments that occur. Uh, so I'd like to begin by um, uh, running through 10 minutes of uh, background material, which you, uh, since it's e economics, and I'm not an economist, uh, it, it, it stands a very good chance of being total nonsense. But uh, anyway, I, I can do my best to interpret it for you. Um, and, and off we go. How do I advance this thing? Ah, it works. But first of all, I start by, start by saying that uh, the first World War period of Britain, of course, was, was a, a world leading power, uh, about to be overtaken, if not already overtaken, by the United States. Uh, and we came out of First of all, why we not do well? Uh, these are the um, uh, figures for, for the, uh, uh, the inter-allied indebtedness, and they come from uh, Keynes' estimates. You can see the USA was a great um, uh, source of finance and, and uh, equipment during the war, and uh, almost every, all, all the Allied uh, nations were indebted to the United States, which was with war value less and made a good thing out of tax cuts. Uh, the UK uh, owed um, uh, what did we owe? 4,000 of them, um, 4,200 million pounds in the United States for uh, uh, war debts. But uh, we also made uh, um, loans to other allied nations to the tune of 8,000 million pounds. So our net position that we were owed 4,490 million pounds at the end of the war. So we came out of it financially uh, reasonably well. However, looking at that list, I noticed that Russia was there for 2,840 million pounds. And the thought of getting that sort of money out of Russia in 1917 is a bit of a risk. Anyway, we did very well. But there was, of course, other costs involved. Uh, our infrastructure survived well, remarkably well. But we had three, three quarters of a million more dead, and mainly able uh, uh, young men. And uh, we had uh, nearly two million pounds. Uh, sorry, two million people in, in, uh, in war wounded, uh, of whom over a million were in receipt of, uh, of pensions. So there was a considerable legacy from that sort of thing. But uh, there were other problems caused by the war which didn't um, bode well for the British industry. Uh, for instance, this is how food and prices changed during the time. I've taken 1900 as being equal to 100. Um, and uh, so everything is compared with prices at, uh, in 1900. You can see that before the First World War, prices hardly moved at all. There's a small degree of inflation, but in real terms, uh, uh, prices uh, increased and wages increased by the order of uh, well, less than one percent per year. As soon as the war started, prices shot up. Um, and at the end of the war, they were three and a half times higher than they had been in 1900. So there were 15% per annum uh, price rises, which people had to contend with. Uh, and uh, alas, uh, money wages didn't arise, uh, arise quite so quickly. It was a two year lag. And that meant that uh, ordinary people uh, had to pay a great deal of money uh, for their food. So there was no food rationing, but food was expensive during the war. And uh, after the war, the prices continued to rise. There was hardly any strike during the war, despite all this uh, inflation, because people were patriotic. Uh, after the war, there was um, uh, a huge price falls uh, because uh, we returned to peacetime conditions. And the unions, of course, were not keen on, on losing their, um, their, their album wages. So there was going to be a massive disruption. 
and there was a, a big strike in 1921, uh, and uh, a general strike in 1926. But nevertheless, uh, the miners who led these strikes came out very badly on those occasions and had to suffer uh, a massive wave reductions. But uh, these were only in line with, um, with the fault in the cost of living. Uh, so uh, it wasn't as bad as it would. Nevertheless, there was massive deflation uh, during, the, um, uh, during the 1920s. And deflation is very hard to live with. Um, the other thing that uh, is worth looking at is the, um, is the, the, the GDP, the gross domestic product, or in this case, is described as being the national income, the head of the population, which is considered to be a pretty good guide to how wealthy society is and how it's doing. And you can see that prior to the war, we were flatlining. We were no longer growing as we have been during the Victorian era. But um, we were going through the um, Edwardian period, sitting back on our hours and rather enjoying things. And there was no real growth in the economy. As soon as the war came, there was inflation. So uh, national income appeared to rise. But in real terms, uh, it remained uh, static. After the war, uh, it grew at 2.4% per year. Before the war, it was growing at 0.4% figure in real terms. So the war did do something for us. It boosted the economy and made it grow five times faster, which was no mean achievement. So there is some payback uh, uh, from the war, I suppose. Um, we might look at um, uh, individual industries, because how the war affected different industries was, was varied. We find that on the whole, the old industries, those that have created a great fitness to the a world leader, uh, the traditional industries, if you like, uh, suffered. They all started uh, their period of decline, and they declined continuously throughout the 20th century and finally vanished. Um, but um, new industries came along, so if we have a look at the old industries, coal is, uh, is very fundamental. You see, the maximum um, production per year of coal was uh, in 1913, just before the war. Uh, it declined during the war, mainly because coal, coal exports declined. We stopped exporting and stuff. Uh, a lot of mines, of course, were quite high uh, After the war, uh, there was terrible uh, industrial relations. This was partly due because um, we were still using very old fashioned methods to, 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 to win coal. Uh, only 30% in 1930 of uh, coal was won by a machine. And uh, we still we still dig it out of the pits, and we still cart it into the uh, uh, along the uh, uh, the pit bottom by uh, by pit bodies. Uh, we were still very old fashioned. Uh, by 1940, only 40 percent of the machine uh, uh, coal was, was being produced, which is uh, uh, rather uh, rather telling. It was a tough lack of investment. And, uh, and it's hardly surprising that the miners were very discontented with their lot. Uh, things hadn't improved. We weren't using conveyor belts. We weren't living coal uh, uh, with machines. As opposed to America and Germany, where in 19, by 1939, over 90% of coal was being won by, by machine and conveyed from the, from the workplace by conveyor belt. That was not so in this country. Uh, we can have a quick look at the iron and steel manufacturer. Um, uh, that was surprisingly, very surprisingly to me, but I find that um, uh, steel uh, grew very quickly in the pre-war period and uh, continued to grow during the war uh, and in fact became, um, uh, we produced more steel uh, forgings and castings than, uh, than cast iron and pig iron. It occurred to me that pig, uh, steel is made out of pig iron. I couldn't understand why we were producing more steel than we were producing pig iron. But of course, the economists still double count. Uh, they, they subtract uh, from the pig iron total the amount that it's used for steel. So, so it, there's no double counting here. Uh, for, for information, wrought iron, puddle iron, was still being produced at this period. It had its uh, height in the uh, 1870s, I suppose. But it declined uh, rapidly and was accounting for well less than 10% uh, of, of the total. So I, I haven't bothered to put um, a puddle line on the graph. Cotton is hardly an engineering subject, but um, it was 40% of our economy. And we did produce um, over a third of the world's cotton. A huge quantity of cotton uh, for the rest of the world was shipped out of Liverpool and was uh, our major export industry. 
that suffered. It was growing quickly before the war, but during the war it voluntarily reduced production. Because we were using 40% um, of our ships and shipping, cotton industry in Lancashire purposely went on short time working and stopped producing the stuff to release ships um, for the war effort. And that was a voluntary arrangement, and it's one which showed well, they were cutting their own foot because they lost um, foreign markets. And after the war, those foreign markets didn't come back. They found alternative supplies to the war, the United States, India, Japan, and so on. And uh, Lancashire cotton uh, did not recover from the war and, and continued to decline and vanish uh, about 1970 or 1980. Just pressing buttons, hasn't happened. Uh, ships built, um, highly cyclical, cyclical. It was. Um, Subject to trade cycles, of course, uh, shipbuilding. But uh, this is just put up really to remind you that uh, we we had 40% um, of the world's shipping, and we and we moved 40% of the world's goods uh, around the world. Uh, we were um, in shipping terms. I think we had 20 million tons uh, after the war. We lost 90 million tons during the war, but that all that had been replaced within a year of, of the war finishing. Our shipbuilding was. was very, very geared up. Um, and we built ships for really for the, for the rest of the world. Uh, technology was changing somewhat. Uh, the, the Navy had started to produce um, uh, uh, going up to oil fire uh, uh, steam boiler, uh, boilers, whereas um, instead of coal. But the commercial uh, uh, ship builders didn't really follow suit. Uh, as quickly as the old flag, but again, there's a lack of investment. Uh, electricity is one of the new industries uh, that came along. Uh, it's been around since the 1870s when Edison and Swan so and the uh, light bulb. But um, in 1919, only 26% of British homes had electricity, uh, were wired for electricity. Uh, so it was very small. The main user, users of electricity, it was always produced locally within the, within the uh, local town authorities, and uh, everyone used a different frequency and a different voltage. So it was, uh, it was a bit chaotic. The main users were uh, uh, the tram, tram lights, the tramways, uh, public lighting, and, uh, and, and public utilities, that, that sort of thing. Private houses haven't really got into it. Uh, that happened really after the 1930s, in the 1930s. Uh, uh, National Grid came along in 1926, and was not completed until 1933. So it was a very slow transfer uh, there. And finally, we all moved to another new industry, which is uh, uh, the automotive industry. Uh, which had, uh, we were always had no cars in the country than either France or Germany. Uh, and it grew steadily, it uh, grew very quickly, in fact, uh, during this period. When the British, when the DEF, when, when the Shah went to war in France, they had the amazing numbers of um, 80 cars. But they took 880 cars with them uh, because they requisitioned 800 cars from, from private owners. Uh, they, they were not really mechanised. Uh, they went to war. By, by the time they finished the war, horses were out and cars and military vehicles and tanks and things were in. And, uh, and they had 53,000 cars, and uh, I can't remember how many motorcycles, 30,000, uh, and so on. So they, uh, the war effort uh, boosted. Um, motor car production. Uh, it also created uh, a large number of, of, of young men who knew more about cars than they did about horses. Mm -hmm. So it was going to do the industry a, a, a lot of, of, of good. And finally, I should say something about uh, what happened to the old industries and, and what happened <coughs> to the new industries. I prepared this graph, it's the one I'm going to end with. Um, you can see the dark on the left is the growth rates in individual counties between 1845 and 1851, nearly the height of the Industrial Revolution. And you can see that South Wales, uh, the West Midlands, Lancashire and, and, and Yorkshire, uh, the, the North East and the, um, and the Scottish uh, Industrial Belt, were all the places that were growing rapidly. They were growing because they could offer jobs and people were moving there. And they were moving there from, from the uh, poorer agricultural regions of, of the country. Between 1921 and 1931, the, the reverse happened. South Wales, which actually was growing in, in, in the Victorian era, 
started to shrink. It was losing population. Now, miners were, were abandoning the mines in, in large numbers. Um, Cold War II was shrinking. And uh, the northeast of England was shrinking. Or virtually uh, the whole of uh, mid, mid and north Wales was shrinking, losing population. Almost the whole of Scotland was losing population. The places that were growing were immediately to the north and, and west of London and, and along the south coast. This is where the jobs were being created. This is where the new industries were. And the old industries, uh, which were uh, largely at these places on the... It's not working. Oh, it's there. Mainly in these areas here, um, uh, were, were actually suffering and shrinking. So I think that illustrates the point of And that's all I have to say. And uh, I'm finished at 10 minutes, which is the time I'm sure to finish at. Um, and with that, I will hand over to, uh, to uh, Fred Starr, who will be your uh, chairman of the investment. Thank you very much.